The ocean has long been called one of the last great frontiers for mankind to discover. We have all heard that only 5% of the ocean has even been explored, and to have that much of something that practically everyone has seen at least once in their life to still remain in this state of mystery truly speaks of its size and power. The ocean has been home to countless mysteries throughout history, from ghost ships, banishing islands, and numerous souls lost to the seemingly infinite waters. The ocean also plays host to the upcoming story you're about to hear. On the evening of December 15th, 1900, a steamer ship named the Arch Tour was making its way to Edinburgh, Scotland. As it was passing through the Flannan Isles, the crew noticed that the lighthouse located on the main island of Eileen Moor was not functioning, as they could see no source of light coming from the newly built lighthouse. Knowing that this was extremely dangerous due to the surrounding area being littered with sharp, jagged rocks just waiting to stop a ship dead in its tracks and sink it to the bottom of the ocean. The crew of the Arch Tour made note to inform the lighthouse board of this when they docked. Puzzled by this, however, as the ship made its way further from Eileen Moor, those on board couldn't help but wonder what caused the blackout. Assuming it was just a mechanical issue, or perhaps they were refilling the light with kerosene and it was just bad timing. But little did the crew of the Arch Tour know that it wasn't due to any of these reasons. As the three keepers of the lighthouse weren't busy, or even sleeping, they had vanished. And the mysteries surrounding that would go on to be unsolved for over a century. This is the story of the Eileen Moore Lighthouse. Making land on the 18th of December, the crew of the Arch Tour almost immediately alerted the board of their sighting of the lighthouse, and from there, a ship named the Hesperus was set to depart to investigate the area as well as relieve the keepers. Due to poor weather conditions, however, the original departure date of December 20th was pushed back by several days, but by the 26th of December, the ship had arrived at the Flannan Isles. At first, things seemed normal. The lighthouse was of course still standing, no sign of damage could be seen, and all appeared to be in working order. But then the captain, Jim Harvey, noticed that was in fact the only thing he did see. What he didn't see were any of the three lighthouse keepers. None on the dock waiting for the ship to arrive, none at the top of the lighthouse, none even on the grounds of the island. Nobody was around. Puzzled by this, as he knew they would have seen the ship coming from miles away, he blew the whistle of the Hesperus to get some kind of response, and hopefully see one of the men make their way down. Yet, minutes passed and nothing. Concerned now, Harvey fired a flare, and still, nothing emerged from the lighthouse. Unaware if the island could have been ravaged by pirates and not wanting to risk the safety of the entire ship, Harvey called for Joseph Moore, who was the relief keeper, to get in a boat and make his way to the dock and investigate what was happening. On his arrival to the island, Moore made his way up the stairs from the landing dock and came to the gate of the entrance at the compound. The gate was closed, however, as was the main door to the lighthouse. Feeling a sense of dread as he made his way to the door, Moore couldn't help but start to remember the stories of the island, and how it was cursed by the lost souls of the ocean, and it was forever watched by vicious sea monsters. The 
The Flannan Isles are a group of seven small islands, around 15 miles northwest of the Isle of Lewis in the United Kingdom. They are split into three groups. The northern islands, Eileen Moore and Eileen Tagui. To the south are Surrey and Seguir Tamain. And to the west are the remaining three, Eileen Aguba, Roerium, and Brona Cliet. I'm very sorry if I butchered those names. The largest and most well-known Eileen Moore holds only two structures, the lighthouse itself, built in 1889, and a derelict chapel that has been in ruins for almost as long as time itself. The island, however, has its history with superstition and customs. Eileen Moore was actually a frequent place for sheep to herd without having to worry about them getting too far away since they actually wouldn't go anywhere near the cliff's edge, and farmers would also gather bird eggs while they were there as well. Although before they could do that, there was said to be a rather specific tradition that was required before anything could be taken. When the crews of the visiting boats had reached a specific spot about 20 paces from the altar of this chapel, they removed their clothes, which they laid upon a stone placed there for that purpose. They then prayed three times. The first prayer as they advanced towards the chapel on their knees. The second as they traveled sunways round the chapel. And the third within the chapel itself. Having an island so associated with superstitious beliefs left an impact on the locals in the surrounding area. Tales of sea creatures and monsters filled the ears of children and fishermen alike, and that type of talk, especially back then, stuck with most as they didn't want to risk angering the ocean and those who inhabit it. And so, the tradition stuck. Those tales were probably aiding in Joseph Moore's building fear as he opened the main door to the lighthouse and what he found did nothing to lower his growing panic. What was discovered was an almost perfectly normal, lived-in lighthouse. A scene that, given if people were there, nobody would pay any mind to, but nobody could be found. What Moore found was a kitchen with half-eaten food and utensils on it unmade beds, unlocked doors, even an overturned chair. But what stood out most to Moore was that a clock had stopped and two of the three oilskin coats were missing. The growing sense of fear and panic was overwhelming to Moore, and he quickly made his way back to the Hesperus and told Captain Harvey of his discovery. The island was searched by several of the crew and nothing was found. No clues and no sign of the three now missing lighthouse keepers. James Duckett, Thomas Marshall, and Donald MacArthur. Captain Harvey made his way back to his ship, but before he departed back for Lewis, he sent out a telegram to the lighthouse board. A dreadful accident has happened at Flannan's. The three keepers, Duckett, Marshall, and the occasional, have disappeared from the island. On our arrival there this afternoon, no sign of life was to be seen on the island. Fired a rocket, but as no response was made, managed to land Moore, who went up to the station but found no keepers there. The clocks were stopped, and other signs indicated that the accident must have happened about a week ago. Poor fellows, they must have been blown over the cliffs or drowned trying to secure a crane or something like that. Night coming on, we could not wait to make something as to their fate. I have left Moore, MacDonald, Boymaster, and two seamen on the island to keep the light burning until you make other arrangements. Will not return to Oban until I hear from you. I have repeated this wire to Murhead in case you are not at home. I will remain at the telegraph office tonight until it closes, if you wish to wire me. As the Hesperus left, Moore and several others stayed back on Eileen Moore to man the lighthouse and continue searching for any clues as to what may have happened to the original three keepers. They searched all over the island looking for anything, a clothing item, a personal effect. At this rate, they were even looking for a body, but nothing was found. 
they finally came to the western side of the island, which as well had an area for things to be stored and boats to dock at, and here they found several startling clues. First was the iron bars. They were almost completely destroyed. The bars were bent and twisted, and it looked like the aftermath of something ramming into them, with some parts of the gate being ripped out from its concrete base. A crate holding different types of equipment, such as oil for the lights or ropes, was as well destroyed, and its contents were all over the area. One thing to note is that this crate was 108 feet above sea level, and what shocked the men the most was that a massive rock, practically a boulder, weighing over a ton, was actually moved from its original position. Later on, the men also discovered that some of the grass had been ripped up. This grass was 33 feet from the edge of the cliff and over 200 feet above sea level. The cranes that were used to move the crates of equipment were also heavily damaged. Other than that, nothing else was found. No bodies of the three men were discovered, and no explanation as to the condition of the western landing could be given by the men or more. A few days later, on the 29th of December, a superintendent named Robert Murhead arrived at the island to conduct an official investigation. What he found was not much different than what was already reported by Moore and the others. He examined the western landing and was actually surprised at the amount of carnage. He even was quoted as saying he wouldn't have believed it if he hadn't actually seen it for himself. Murhead did, however, discover a logbook that told a very interesting tale. For those of you familiar with this story, you will know what I am talking about. But for those of you who haven't heard it, here is what the logbook said. December 12th. Storm is growing in strength and showing no signs of letting up. Duckett is very quiet. MacArthur is crying. December 13th. Storm continues to worsen. Duckett is quiet. MacArthur is praying. December 14th. Storm is still here. We all pray. December 15th. Storm ended. Sea calm. God is over all. This is probably the most well-known part of this story, and for good reason. It gives us a glimpse into what happened that night. Yet, with this information, all it did was create more questions than it gave answers. No storms have been reported the nights recorded in the logbook, and no passing ships in the area even saw anything remotely close to what was written. Yet, here in this book, it conflicts those accounts. But if there were in fact a storm, why would three grown men be crying over it? Why would seasoned lighthouse keepers Duckett and Marshall especially be afraid or even concerned over a storm when they were in a brand new, extremely safe lighthouse? None of it made any sense and this is where the story normally ends for most. But I wanted to keep digging and bring some sort of answers or at least a very plausible theory into what happened to these three men. When Murhead read the logbook, he was just as puzzled and didn't understand what storm the men were talking about as previously mentioned. And even if there had been a storm and the three men were telling the truth, why would they leave the safety of the lighthouse when not only it goes against natural instinct, but it is also a rule to never leave it unattended? Realizing that with the entire area searched and no signs of life from the men, Murhead concluded his investigation with this. From the evidence which I was able to procure, I was satisfied that the men had been on duty up until dinner time on Saturday the 15th of December that they had gone down to secure a box in which the mooring ropes, landing ropes, were kept, and which was secured in a crevice in the rock about 110 feet above sea level, and that an extra-large sea had rushed up the face of the rock, had gone above them, coming down with immense force, had swept them completely away. And that was that. The investigation was concluded, and new keepers were stationed at Eileen Moore to man the lighthouse. But 
To many, the unanswered question of what actually happened didn't go away. The thoughts of the logbook, the state of the western dock, even the disturbed grass nowhere near the cliff's edge. Nothing made sense. Throughout the years, decades actually, theories have been given to find some sense of closure to the mystery, and not many are in the realm of fact. There have been theories of sea monsters, that one of the men murdered the other two, that the island was invaded by pirates, that the men left to start a new life, and of course, alien abduction. While I don't believe in any of those theories, I do want to bring something to your attention that I found to be very shocking. Remember that logbook, the one that is always mentioned? Well, what struck me as very surprising was when I learned that this logbook that so many people have mentioned in numerous tellings of this story, it never actually said any of those things, and in fact were later added after the events and have never been proven as fact. This would make so much more sense. The logbook was discovered to have none of those entries by a journalist named Mike Dash, and it helped paint a clearer picture for this century-old mystery. Here is what I think happened, and it is very similar to the original investigation from Murhead. I believe sometime between the 7th, which was when Moore was last on the island, and the 15th, which was when the Arch Tour first saw the lighthouse not operating, sometime in those 8 days there were large waves crashing into Eileen Moore. Not those caused by storms, but waves that could have been created by numerous other reasons. The thing to note here is that the island is pocketed with these natural areas known as geos, which are essentially narrow pathways that end in a cave, and when water hits the back of them, it explodes explodes back out, sometimes with extreme force. And there was one that just so happened to be right next to the western landing. So, what I believed happened was one night, Duckett, Marshall, and MacArthur are doing their regular jobs, when they begin to notice violent waves crashing and hitting the western side of the island. Realizing that there is equipment down there and the waves are hitting the crane with such force that it actually begins moving. Duckett and Marshall run downstairs, grab their coats, and make for the landing to secure the equipment. Marshall knows they will be fined if anything is damaged, so to avoid this, they are going to attempt to secure it. Not realizing the waves have gotten worse, the two men are busy with the crane when MacArthur notices more waves are coming, even bigger ones than the prior, and rushes out, forgetting his jacket, knocking over a chair, and hurries to the dock to warn the men. But he is too late, and they have already been swept away by a wave, swallowed by the sea. MacArthur attempts to find them, but is as well made a victim, taking any hope of rescue with him. More waves crash, destroying the gate, crane, equipment, and moving the boulder. The entire landing platform now lays wet from seawater and covered in broken wood and untied rope, and the three men succumb to the ocean, leaving the lighthouse without a keeper and any sound of screaming is faded by the ocean waves. I hope you enjoyed this video. This one was very interesting for me, and to read all about it and really learn the whole story to it and finding out that the logbook was not even a real thing made it even more shocking. I know my theory can only be that, just a theory, as nobody can confirm this is what 100% happened, but I feel I gave it the best answer with the material and evidence presented to me. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.
stay safe out there, friends. Good night. Thank you.